Um, I trust that you guys had a good weekend and that you went to church. I trust that you went to church. And, uh, yo, <laughs> why am I so excited? I think I'm excited because, okay, we haven't had a live since Thursday. And I think I low-key, low-key, low-key missed you guys. Uh, and I'm happy that we're here again today. So, um, so we are here, we are here, we are here. And we've been, we've been, we've been touching on a whole lot of things. Um, trying to look at the financial aspect of the kingdom of God. Trying to, uh, trying to make us see... <laughs> Uh, Sunday I said we went to church and gave. Yes, I hope you went to church and you 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 gave according to the instruction of God. Because you know there are certain things that we can't ignore. We can't ignore principle over anything. We can't like if principles stand and principles stand and say this is what God says. The best thing we can do to ourselves is go with what the principle says. You know. So yeah, we looked at a whole lot of things. We looked at a whole lot of things and. I think the last thing that we looked at was when Abraham, um, when when after Abraham was um, kicked out of Egypt, scripture tell, told us, told us, told us that Abraham went back to his place where he was, you know, and scripture says that when he got there, he went back to the altar that he had prepared for God for, for sacrifice, the altar that he had prepared to God to worship God. And I remember explaining this, people of God, I would say that please, um, it's always good to go back to the videos that we have shared before just to try and understand where we are, you understand? So I've made it clear for the past couple of weeks that when we're talking about the fact that Genesis chapter 13 verse 14, uh, Genesis chapter 13 verse 3 and 4, that Abraham went back to the place where he had been between Bethel and Hai and he went to the altar which he had made at first, and there Abraham called the name of the Lord. I was explaining this, that in the New Testament, right, we are not taught about these things. We are not taught about uh, men who have to erect altars for this and that. We are not taught about that, right? So, but what we get from what we're talking about, Abraham, is that these men honored God. Do you understand? They honored God. So what we learn from Abraham going back to uh, his first place where he used to stay and going to his altar to call upon God. We are learning the honor that Abraham had to, for God and we are learning the fact that Abraham always ran back to God. Do you understand? So, ish, okay, let me not end up talking about what I don't want to talk about today. So today I want us to continue from where we left off. Genesis chapter 13 verse 4. Genesis chapter 13 verse 4. Genesis chapter 13 verse 4. And today, if time allows, right, we're going to talk about... Um, we're going to leave the story of Abraham today. And if time allows, we're going to come to the New Testament again just to try and see what the New Testament teaches about this that we're talking about, right? So Genesis chapter 13 verse 6, uh, verse 5. Let's start from verse 5. So Genesis chapter 13 verse 5 says, And Lot also who went with Abraham had flocks and heads and tents. So scripture tells us about Lot. It says, when Abraham left his father's house, when God told him to leave, Abraham left with the Lot. The people that left Abraham's father's house were Abraham, Sarah, and Lot. Do you understand? And maybe they are servants, but the three main people that left were Abraham, um, Sarah, and Lot. So when we get to Genesis chapter 13, it tells us about Lot, that Lot who left with Abraham, now Lot had flocks and heads and tents. So I want you to understand that when Abraham left his father's house, he was not a rich man. He, he, he was just an okay man. Like we said that the Abraham had been staying with his father at the age of 75. So that goes on to show us the state of a lifestyle that Abraham was living. But Abraham at that state of 75, living with his father, leaves his father's house and God begins to prosper him. God begins to multiply him to the extent that scripture says that Lot even, also Lot who was with Abraham, began to get rich too. Lot also now had flocks, he had heads, Lot had tents. So Lot just by associating himself with Abraham gets to a point where scripture says that he's rich too now. So remember what we said when we when we started talking about this. When we started talking about this, we were saying when God appeared to Abraham and spoke to Abraham, he said to Abraham, Abraham, 
I shall I shall make all the families of the earth to be blessed through you. And God said to Abraham also, listen, God said to Abraham, you shall be a blessing. So we were saying Abraham became the manifestation of a blessing. Abraham was the physical form of a blessing. And I remember we also looking at the scriptures where scripture says, God said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. I, so and then we looked at a situation whereby Abraham went to Egypt and the, the the Pharaoh took Abraham's wife and God went to fight for Abraham because uh, the Pharaoh had just um because because the Pharaoh the Pharaoh had just uh people of God please if we have a moderator can can we remove this person from the live the one with uh, glasses and the finger um so we see God we see God coming to fight for Abraham. Do you understand? We see God coming to fight for Abraham and God is just fighting for Abraham, people of God. And now and now when we when we when we get to Lot, we see that Lot also gets to a point where God multiplies Lot. Lot gets multiplied, but why is Lot getting multiplied? It's because Lot is associating himself with Abraham. He's associating himself with the blessing. So it's like it's like it's like it's like what began to happen, it's like, dear God, what's happening? Oh, okay, no, it's fine. So it's like, God began to bless Lot because Lot is with Abraham. Okay, you will understand where this is going. Let's just reach. So Genesis chapter 13 verse 6 says, And the land, so listen, verse 5 says, Lot now also had flocks and heads and tents. So verse 6 says, And the land was not able to bear them that they should dwell together, for their substance was so great that they could not dwell together. And then scripture goes on to say that, And there was strife between the headmen of Abraham's cattle and the headmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt then in the land. And Abraham said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, before between me and you, uh, and between your headmen and my headmen. So listen, Abraham and Lot have been working together for a very long time now, um, and Lot is following Abraham. Abraham is following God. So because Lot's association with Abraham, God has multiplied Lot, and Abraham continuously gets multiplied too, to the point where Scripture says that they got to a point, verse 6, where the land was not able to carry them both. It's like they prospered so much that where they were staying began to get too small for two of, for the two of them. You know, God, we're talking about a situation whereby um, you are staying wherever you are staying. You are staying in Joburg, you are staying in Devon, you are staying wherever you are staying. I stay in Limpopo, you are staying in Limpopo, you stay in Limpopo and you are following God to the point that God multiplies you so much together with your nephew, together with your cousin, to the point that now there is no room for the two of you in one city. That's what began to happen. They multiplied so much to the point where there was no room for the two of them. And the scripture says that their workers started to fight. Their workers started to fight because they're like, nah, there's no room. People of God, are you getting what I'm trying to say? What I'm trying to say is, Lot got multiplied for God by God because of following Abraham. He gets multiplied so much that now he's almost as rich as Abraham. But Abraham is richer, but they've both been multiplied. People of God, just imagine how it will be. These are, these are life problems that we need. If, if we need problems in life, we need these kind of problems. Where God multiplies us so much, where God multiplies me so much that I now come to you and I'm like, you know what, this city is now too small for the two of us. Can't you like, can't you like go to another city? Or like, can't you, can't you go somewhere else? Like there's no more businesses for you to open here. Like I run all the business. It's like now this city is too small. So these were the problems that they they began to face. And scripture, scripture says that Abraham says to Lord that... Um, let there be no strife between me and you and between our head men, uh, for we are brethren. Do you understand? So I'm saying, this is what I want you to get, right? I want you to get that the devil, the devil, it's like during those days, the devil saw that he couldn't stop the riches that they had. He couldn't stop the multiplication that they were receiving from God. He could not stop their prosperity. He could not stop their multiplication, you understand, by maybe trying to kill their animals or trying to get people to steal their animals. You couldn't prosper through that. Remember when we were looking at Job, when we were looking at Job, we looked at the, the, the case that with Job, there was a hedge of protection around Job. 
to the extent that the devil couldn't even take even one cow from Job, one donkey from Job, the devil could not take because there was a hedge protecting Job. Do you understand? We also looked at Isaac, how that God multiplied Isaac so much in Ephema. Now that Isaac would dig up a well and find water, he would dig up another well and find water. He sowed a seed in Ephema and then prospered. So also with Isaac, the devil sees that, okay, I can't really temper with his well. So what must I do? This is the devil thinking about Isaac. He starts thinking, let me stir up the Philistines to start hating on Isaac so that they kick him out of, of their land. And he started staring up the Philistines. The Philistines come and say to Isaac, you have to leave. So now when we come to Abraham and, and his nephew Lot, we see the same thing. The devil sees that he can't penetrate the wealth that Abraham, uh, that Abraham and Lot have. He, maybe he tried by all means to try and steal their wealth, try, but he could not up until he started deciding, you know what, let me make their headsmen fight. Let me make their workers start fighting amongst themselves. So the workers started fighting amongst themselves. So I want to say that there is one principle that I keep on noticing, you know, there is one principle that I keep on noticing every time when I try to study, how is it that these men were able to multiply and prosper so much? And I begin to understand that people of God, um, um, the devil couldn't dispute their wealth from increasing because these men had principles towards God. We read about Abraham last week that Abraham, Abraham, wherever Abraham went, he would make sure that he builds an altar. And remember, I said we don't teach altars in the New Testament, right? We, we don't have a basis to say that you must build an altar for this. No, we're only told about an altar which is in heaven. We're going to talk about that one day, right? The, the altar where Jesus Christ appeared in, do you understand? So I want to use the altar of Abraham just to try and teach us about something that we can learn from that. I'm not saying go and build altars. He did not teach that. I don't want to be in trouble with the Lord over things that the, new, the, the Lord did not teach us about. But I want to teach you about something about Abraham that we can, I want us to see this as honor. How that, we say this on the last slide, that an altar to Abraham, it represented a place of sacrifice, a place of honor, a place of gratefulness to the Lord. Where God multiplies him so much and Abraham takes one of his cows, one of his gods as a sacrifice to God on the altar. So his altar represents honor, it represents gratefulness. This is Abraham taking whatever he's taking to God to the altar saying, Lord, you have blessed me so much. Now I'm taking this and I'm presenting this to you as a bent offering to show my thankfulness. So I'm saying the reason why the devil does not seem to be able to penetrate their blessings, their multiplication, he can't stop them from multiplying. It's because these men have found a way into the heart of God through dedicating their substance to God. Every time when God multiplies them, they are, they are, they are, they are not in a position where they want to withhold anything. When God multiplies them, they want to give back to the Lord. We also maybe learned something similar to this when Abraham met Melchizedek. So Abraham met Melchizedek, and Abraham's principle is this principle, that every time when I receive from God, I need to give back to God. And scripture says that he meets Melchizedek, and Melchizedek was a priest of God. And the moment Ab Melchizedek says to Abraham, Abraham of the Most High God, Abraham, scripture says that Abraham began to give Melchizedek, because that's... It's like that's a principle that they follow. I'm not teaching about tithing here, right? I'm just trying to teach about an, an, a, a tradition that these men had of honoring God with their substance. I can't meet with God and not give God. Do you understand? This was their principle. I can't be in a position where God is prospering me so much and I can't give back to God. They are like, nah, whether what I'm getting is enough, it's not enough. I need to honor God. God must be honored. Whether this, people of God, we always say that we praise God, we worship God. Whether things are good or bad, we praise and worship. Giving should be like that too. You understand? Giving should be like, we, we can't be people who tell ourselves that we give because things are good. Then there's no honor there. There's no gratefulness there. Do you understand? But these men are men who understand something about God. Whenever I receive something from God, I should give it back to God. I should somehow find a way to give it back to God. And now when we read Genesis chapter 13, we discover that Abraham ended up deciding, you know what? Because I love honoring God with my substance, I'm going to create an altar in my house. Now I won't need to go anywhere to honor God. I'll honor God in my house. I'll build an altar. Every time when I want to honor God, it's ready there. Do you understand? So I remember we were saying this, that it's like Abraham was this kind of man that every time when he gets a new house, wherever he's traveling, because remember, Abraham used to travel a lot. So wherever he travels, he has to make sure that he builds himself a place to honor God. So I'm saying every time when I studied this man, I begin to discover that this could have been their secret. Their secret was that they honor God with their wealth. 
They honor God with their little, they honor God with their much. Whether Abraham is carrying wealth of Sodom and Gomorrah, it's not even his. The moment he meets Melchizedek, he tells himself, hey, I'm carrying something. I just got something from it. Oh, I'll give it to God, whether it's mine or not. So I'm trying to tell, to show us that these men had a way of honoring God that we have not mastered yet. And as a result, the devil can't touch any of their riches. He can't touch anything that they have. And God continues to multiply them. Do you understand? Okay, so let's let's go on. So um, we are saying, so their secret is that their secret is that they are constantly being given over to God. It's like they are constantly submitting themselves, submitting their substance to God. They are constantly doing that. This is a part of their life, that they are constantly submitting their substance to God. Do you understand? So I want to say this, that um, we spoke about Job and we say that Job's multiplication was spiritual. People of God, God's multiplication was spiritual. Abraham's multiplication was spiritual. Job's wealth was spiritual. Abraham's wealth was spiritual. Do you understand? God says to Abraham, I will bless you. In multiplication, I'll multiply you. And uh, God also does the same thing with Job, right? He blesses Job so much. So, you know, as I was just, as I was just analyzing these two men, Isaac, Abraham and Job, just trying to find one common thing. If we try to summarize this whole thing and say, how did these men make it through God? How did they make it through God? And you know, I began to, <laughs> I began to notice something, a point that I'm going to share. I began to, I began to notice that, you know what? It's like, it's like Abraham, Job and Isaac. It's like they discovered God's muti of prosperity. You know, we know that people who are doing witchcraft out there, they prosper through muti. Well, what do we call muti in English? I don't even know what muti is in English. It's like they, So I, I want to say that it's like these guys were using God's way of prosperity. And just to try and put it in a playful way, in a joking manner, I want to say that it's like they discovered God's muti to prosperity. That the way to prosper through God is to honor him. Honor him with your substance. Honor if he blesses you, whether it's enough or it's not enough, you honor him. Do you understand? So I, I'm not saying, people of God, don't go around saying, yeah, that guy, that pastor says God is multi. No, it's just a joke. It's just a way of trying to make this make more sense. Do you understand? That it's like these men understood God's way of doing things, God's way of prosperity. And they discover that the, the way to winning God's heart, it's just honoring him back. I should just honor God back. That is the secret. I should just honor God back. And you know what? Once I teach myself to honor God, I'm done with this whole equation. Do you understand? So, so, so we are saying Job's wealth is spiritual. Abraham's wealth is spiritual. And the spiritual principle behind that is that these men give back to God. They honor God with their substance. I remember explaining this on the other live, saying this is what you do. You get what you got. You hold it like this and say to the Lord, Lord, this is what I have. This is what you gave me this month. This is what you gave me this month. Lord, you know it's not enough. It's not enough to cover all my needs. My needs are a lot. But I don't trust in money. I trust in you. So I choose to honor you with a part of what I got. Do you understand? I choose to honor you with a part of what I got. It's not enough. And after this, I may not have enough, but I choose to honor you still. This is what this this was the principle that these men used. Do you understand? This was the only principle that these men used. They honored God with their substance. Do you understand? So, so I'm saying so that it's like the devil tries to fight their wealth. Maybe he discovers that he doesn't have another way of fighting their wealth. So now he starts using Abraham servants and Lord servants. They start fighting. Yo, people of God, is this a mosquito? Where's my do? Where is my do? Yo, yo, yo. People of God, yo, look at I sprayed the camera even. Yo, yo, yo. Guys, these things are disturbing us. Ish. Am I clear now? <laughs> uh, guy, why are you laughing? <laughs> it was not a mosquito. It was not a mosquito. It was a fly. It was a fly. <laughs> Okay, you know what? I'm just gonna forget about the comments and focus on. Um, <laughs> I'm just gonna forget about the comments and focus on preaching. Uh, no, it was a fly. It's not a mosquito. It was a. This fly was so big. People, it was like. Have you ever seen a fly like this? It was too big. So okay. 
so I'm saying uh, the enemy had probably tried to fight our people of God. Stop laughing. <laughs> So the enemy had probably tried wrestling up with them, do you understand? But he wrestles with them to the point where, yo, he wrestles with them to a point where he sees that he can't win this fight. So, <laughs> uh, I, okay, let's, let's preach Christ. So he tries to wrestle with them to the point where he sees that he can't win. Do you understand? He sees... Can you see, guys, since I sprayed the camera, I look nice. Can you see? I sprayed the... Because that thing was sitting on top of my phone. So I sprayed the camera and all of a sudden, I look nice. <laughs> so so he tries to disrupt their wealth. He sees that he can't. And what he ends up doing is he ends up making their... He... he, he <laughs> ah, no loss. He tries to now make their servants fight. Do you understand? Because he sees that he can't temper with their wealth. Do you understand? So... <laughs> I, yeah, Shem. <laughs> guys, I can't speak when you when you guys are laughing. <laughs> I, 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 I. Uh. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. Back to back to church now. We are back to church, right? Mm -hmm. So listen, listen to this powerful point. If you've been following the teachings, this is a point that you'd notice again, like replaying itself, right? That um, when when people have got, these are questions that I want to ask. When Isaac started prospering in a fair mind, when Isaac started prospering in a fair mind, what happened? When Isaac started prospering in a fair mind, what happened? Scriptures tell us that the Philistines started coming to say that he must leave. Right. When when Abraham also prospered, what happened? Abraham also started meeting opposition. So I want to say that it's like this problem of people separating or um, division. It, it's, it, it was a weapon that the enemy tried to use all the time, every time when he would see that he's not winning, trying to fight their wealth. So he tries to fight their wealth. He sees that he can't. And the next best thing that he thinks about is, let, let me just make them fight. So scripture says that when they started uh, fighting amongst each other, when they started fighting amongst each other, listen to what Genesis chapter 13 verse 9 says. Genesis chapter 13 verse 9, this is Abraham speaking. He says, is not the whole land before us? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou would take the left hand, I will go to the right. If thou would depart to the right, I will go to the left. So listen, Abraham now starts saying to Lot, because now their servants are fighting, their servants are fighting, and Abraham does not want to continue fighting like that. So he says to Lot, Lot, since it seems like our prosperity is now a problem, we have prospered so much, both of us have prospered so much, now we can't stay in the same place because God has multiplied both of us so much. So Abraham says to the Lord, Lord, if you choose the right, I'll choose the left. Like it's now time for us to separate, right? So uh, a scripture says in verse 10, And Lord lifted up his eyes and beheld the plain of Jordan, uh, that it was well watered and everywhere. Uh, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zohar. People of God, listen, listen to this, listen to this point. L listen to this point. So the point now that the Bible, the, 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 the point now, guys, that I'm trying to make is when Abraham says to Lord, Lord, let's separate because we are now too much and this is now causing too many problems. Scripture says that Lord looked, lifted up his eyes. And he behold the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered before God had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It was like the garden of the Lord. So it's like Lord looked at the, that the site that Lord looked, looked, looked at. It looked like the garden of Eden. It looked like the garden of the Lord. It, it was like the land of Egypt. So, and then Lord, scripture says in verse 11, and Lord chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lord journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. So, now, I want you guys to, to hear what I'm about to explain because these are important points, right? These are important points that we need to be aware of if we want to work with the Lord and um, walk in the principles of God and not be led by our own minds. Listen, so we're saying Lord, choose, Lord chooses the green plains. He chooses the best places because Abraham says, look, whichever side you take, I'll take the opposite. If you take the right, I'll take the left. If you take the north, I'll take the south. So we are saying Lot chooses the green places and Abraham took the second best. 
Do you understand? Lot chose the best of the places which were so green, which looked like the Garden of Eden. But what did Abraham do? Abraham cho- took, took the second best because Lot, Lot had chosen. So, listen, this is what I want you to note. Who was the blessing? Who was blessed between the two of them? Who was blessed? Abraham was the one who was blessed, right? And now, because he understands his position in life, he understands that I don't need the best ground. I have the blessing. I don't need to choose the green place. I don't need to choose the best place. I have the blessing. So you, Lord, choose. And Lord, when Lord looked, he looked at the best of the places. He's like, I'm going to take that one. And Abraham was like, fine. Listen, this is a point that I want you to get. So Lord chooses the best of the places. But Lord, it's like the decision that Lord took after seeing the greenest of the greenest of places, it led him to a path of Sodom. He ended up staying in Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen, Lot chose the best looking place and the best looking place took him to Sodom and Gomorrah. We're trying to establish this point here. We're trying to say, how do we make it through God? How do we prosper through God? How do we get to a place where we get multiplied by God? And one of the points that I'm trying to introduce now is the fact that when we are led by God, this, we don't use this, this will lead you, will lead you to trouble. These, these two things here, yeah, they will lead you to trouble. We do not walk by sight. So Abraham understands, Abraham understands this thing. I am the blessed of the Lord. The Lord blessed me. I carry the blessing. All the families of the earth will be blessed through me. Abraham understands that so much. And Lord, 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 Lord has nothing. All that Lord has is just like his two eyes that can just see. Do you understand? And we're saying, people of God, Lord ended up in Sodom and Gomorrah. We all know what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. People of God, listen. So when we start Revelation chapter 13, it tells us how rich Lord was. That Lord was now very rich too. So he took all his riches together with his servants. It led him to Sodom and Gomorrah. People of God, what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Sodom and Gomorrah was bent by fire. Lot lost everything he had. It's like Lot took his wealth, thinking that, yeah, Abraham is trying to grow a big head. This Uncle Abraham thinks he's smart. It led him to a path where he lost everything. Do you understand? So why, why is Lot losing everything? Why can't Lot sustain his, his wealth? It's because Lot has no hedge. Lot has no hedge. His hedge has always been Abraham. Because Abraham is the one who carried the blessing of the Lord. So I'm saying this to you, people of God. So maybe let me just let me just go step by step, right? So we are saying lost, lot. Listen to me saying lost, lost it all. Lot lost it all, not lost, lost it all. Lot lost it all. So Lot lost it all. And why does Lot lose it all? Lot loses it all because he has no hedge. He has no word from God. He has no direction for himself from God. Lot happens to be a believer. One of those believers who just brainstorm, brainstorm, and boom, something comes up and he seems like he's making it. It speaks of Lot. Lot speaks of that believer with no direction, with no word, with nothing. He maybe tries one or two things and it looks like it's working, but he ends up losing everything. He ends up losing everything. Why? Because Lot for himself has no weight, has no substance. People of God, I want to tell you this one point. If we don't make it through the principles of God, we are praise to the enemy. Do you understand? People of God, have you, have you, have you, have you seen people? I, I know a lot of people who used to be rich. I know a lot of people who used to have things, but they don't anymore. And I know people who had things back then, they still have them now. Do you understand? So I'm, I'm trying to say that people of God, how do I explain this? How do I explain? Uh, Lot was like, let me try to use a parable. Maybe let me try to use a parable. Maybe this will make sense. Lot was like that seed that fell on a stone on a rocky place. When the seed tried growing on its own without the good ground, Abraham, it tried growing, it couldn't. The devil just came in a speed and destroyed everything that Lot had. Do you understand? So I'm saying, people of God, it's like if 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 we want to make it through God, if we want to go out there and start businesses without God, we are trying, we are becoming, we, it's like we are planting our seed on a stony place. It's going to grow for a while. 
But when, it, when once it gets to the day where the seed starts needing roots, because seeds needs roots to to grow, do you understand? A seed. Um, starts on a seed form and as it grows it gets to a point where now it needs roots it needs to establish it establish itself so I'm, I'm 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 trying to make us understand the life of lord like that that lord speaks of a person who has no word from god no relationship with god no nothing he's just been associated with abraham abraham who has a word abraham who has direction so now he decides he just wants to part and he loses everything so i'm trying to say that that teaches us this it teaches us the fact that you need a word from god for yourself you need to be led by god for yourself you can't depend on people you can't depend on your pastor you can't well, what will happen the day is not the what will happen you can't. So I'm saying that's why I'm trying to teach you kingdom principles so that you yourself master kingdom principles. You yourself, you master kingdom principles. People of God, kingdom principles don't need, to, don't need you to be a pastor. They don't need you to be a prophet. They just need your consistency and you to obey God. You understand? So, yo, I'm starting to feel hot. So, 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 so listen. So, we're saying the seed, the seed that fell on the on the stony place. You now we are talking about the parable, people of God. What happened to the seed that falls on the stony place? Who knows what happened to the seed that fell on the stony place? It tried to grow, but as it tried to grow, because it didn't have a root, it was scorched by the sun. The sun bent it because it has no roots, right? So it can't go deep and gather its own food on the ground. So when the sun started coming out, the seed was bent and it died. And I want to say what happened to the wealth of Lot? Also, Lord's wealth was just consumed by fire because there is no relationship. There is no substance in Lord. People of God, let's move on. I'm trying to get to a, a, a certain place. So Abraham had taken the second best place, the less, the less green land, um, got very rich and even went on to rescue Lot. Do you understand? So Abraham, who chooses the less green land, the second best, he continued prospering. And when the Lord who chose the best started getting into trouble in Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah was attacked at some point, and Abraham was the one who was called to go and rescue Lot. So can you see two things happen to Lot? First, Sodom and Gomorrah gets attacked. When Sodom and Gomorrah gets attacked, it was Abraham who gathered men to go and rescue Lot. Okay, after Abraham rescues them, fine, Lot continues staying in Sodom. And as Lot continues, continued staying in Sodom and Gomorrah, one day God wants to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. So Abraham, who chose the second best, ends up being the one who has to go to Lot and rescue Lot. And Lot lost everything. Abraham ended up taking Lot back in again when Lot had lost everything. And I'm saying, people of God, it's a pity. It's a pity that most of us normally... Uh, it's a pity that most of us normally take that path throughout our whole life. We keep on starting and starting. We tried that business, it failed. We tried this one, it failed. We just keep on restarting and restarting and restarting. And I'm saying the problem, the main problem is because you don't have a word from God. You are not led. We just we are just led by this. We are like Lord. We lift up our eyes when we see an opportunity that we feel like it will work. We just want to run at it. What did God say? What did God say? Because what will keep you in a storm is the word of God. What will keep you in a storm is what God said to you. What will make you to be of good cheer? Remember Jesus Christ said, In this world you shall have trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. What will keep you when trials and tribulations come? It's the word of God. What will keep you when tough times come in business? It's what God said. If you stick to what God said, it will sustain you. Jesus Christ says, I will liken a, a wise man unto a man who built his house on a rock. And that time the rock is Jesus Christ. He says, a wise man builds on me. A wise man, he builds on me. I, he says, I am that rock. And a wise man builds on the rock. And when the storms of life come, that man will stand because he's built on the rock. But the, a foolish man is a man who builds on sand. He looks at sand. Do you know what, do you know what sand, sand represents? Sand represents something that is easy, like a path that is so easy. People of God, you know that for you to build on sand, you can dig with your own hand like this. You can dig. You can dig on sand with your own hand. You can build a house on sand by in a very short space of time. But if you have to build on the rock, it takes too much time and patience and consistency. So what we do, we want to do the Lord's style. We want to already find the ready green, ready made. That's building on sand. And we are not led by God. And okay, let's not 
let's not stay on that let's not stay on that let's not stay on that so we are saying we're saying the story of abraham and lord teaches us that if we really want to make it through god we 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 must know that we ourselves can't make right decisions this is what you must know about yourself you can't make right decisions you don't know the right decisions god knows the right decisions that's why Paul says, Romans 8, 26, he says the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. He says that that's the, that's the job of the Holy Spirit to come in to help us where we fail. And one of the areas where we fail a lot is making the right decisions. We can't make right decisions. People of God tell me, if it were you, if you were a lot on that day, you are seeing one ground, it's green, very green and very fertile. You are seeing the other ground, yeah, it's like withering a bit. Which one were you going to choose? You are also going to choose the good ground that looks like it's good. Uh, but you don't know that it's leading you to Sodom and Gomorrah and that's the mistake that Lot made. So I'm saying one of the most important things that we must understand is that we can't make the right decisions. Do you understand? We need to be led by God. God should be the one who leads us. Do you understand? So I want to say that we make mistakes when we tell ourselves that we know how to find green pastures. That's where the biggest mistakes begin in our lives. When we tell ourselves that, yeah, I had this, there are opportunities, I hear, I hear, I hear, I hear, I hear. So now we are just being led by hearsays. We are being led by hearsays. So I want to say that there are times where God speaks to you through people. People come and suggest things to you. But I'm saying the most important thing that we do after hearing things, we check with God, we inquire, Lord, should I pursue? Is this a path that you want me to take? People of God, I know that at times putting this into practicality, what I'm saying, it will sound like a slow process. Do you understand? Like you just heard, you, you feel like you need to do it now, but teach yourself to be patient in prayer. Learn to hear God. Learn to cultivate a relationship with God for you. Because if we don't, we'll just always be moving too fast, going nowhere. Do you understand? We'll be running very fast, going nowhere. You, you know that car that's driving at 180, 240 kilometers per hour, but going nowhere. It's like just going around circles. But then you find a car that's just driving at 100. He knows where he's going. A car that's driving at 180 will just pass him in a blink second, but he doesn't know where he's going. But the one who's driving slowly at 100 with God, he knows where he's going. And the one who seems like he's driving too fast, he's just gonna... Okay, let's not talk about that. So I'm saying that the problem that we have or the problem that Lot had on that day, Lot felt like he knows how to find a green pasture. Lot felt to himself, I know how to get up opportunities. It's like Lot told himself, I just found a good business opportunity here. My business shall grow. My cackle shall multiply and grow. So I, I want to say that people of God, we make mistakes when we tell ourselves we know to, how to find green pastures. People of God, scripture says, he leads me to green pastures. He leads me. I don't use this to find green pasture. He leads me to green pastures. He leads me to green pastures, but we we look for the green pastures. We hustle. <laughs> we hustle for the green pastures. And every time when it doesn't work, we don't understand. But God, I thought this door would work. No, but God never said pursue that door. Do you understand? God never said that's the door that he wants for you. So I'm saying that uh, 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 Lot looked for green pastures with his eyes. And I'm saying that the scripture says he leads us to green pastures. You understand? He leaded me to green pastures. So we don't go all out alone. We will lose. Do you understand? We don't go all out alone. We will lose. People of God, Jesus Christ says, I'm going to read this one scripture from the book of John, right? The Bible says in the book of John, John chapter 10, Jesus Christ says, I am the door. People of God, listen to this scripture. Let me drink my water because it's about to get hot. So I'm saying, we don't go out to get green pastures because we don't know where they are. The green pastures that we see with our eyes will lead us to trouble. Do you understand? It will lead us to a very big trouble. So we don't know where the, the, the green pastures are. He leads us to green pastures. So listen, John chapter 10 verse 9. John chapter 10 verse 9. John chapter 10 verse 9 says, John chapter 10 verse 9 says, I am the door. Says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. He shall go in and out and find pasture. Jesus Christ says, I am the door. <laughs> Yo, I wish there was a, a way of explaining this. 
Jesus Christ says, I am the door. Do you understand? He says, if any man enter in, where? Here, through me, through me, the door. I am the door. I am, people of God, I am the door. I am the door. I want that to get into you. I am the door. Do you understand? He says, I am the door. He says, if any man enter in here, he shall go in and out and he shall find pasture. The door is Christ. The door is he. Do you understand? He is the door. We don't go all out there looking for our own doors because they will close. Do you understand? We don't go all out there opening our own doors. They will close. And when they close, we cry out to God and say, God, 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 I don't understand my life. I feel like my life. No, he is the door. Did we enter through him? Was it through Christ that you entered on your last door that you feel like that door closed? Was it Christ? Was it through Christ that you entered that last door that you feel like it closed? Was it Christ? And I'm sure the answer is no. Like it was just one of those brainstorming opportunities. I felt like it was going to work. Maybe we had a lot moment. We saw a green pasture and we felt like, let me go for that. No. But as long as that green pasture is not through, people of God, as long as that green pasture is not through the door, <laughs> the pastures that last are in the door, Jesus Christ, and that door is Jesus Christ, says I am the door. Do you understand? So, I'm saying God needs to be involved in everything. Do you understand? God needs to be involved in every decision that you take and you must be obedient to the voice of God. But of God, it, you know, I know that maybe as I'm talking about this, it might sound like, Ish, these things sound very hard. People, this is how the gospel was always meant to be. This is how the gospel always was in the days of the Bible. Those men that we read about in the Bible, they didn't brainstorm or they didn't wake up one day and just decide. They were led of God. Do you understand? All of those men that we read about in scripture, they were led by God. It's only us now in our current day life where we just brainstorm. We just decide what we want to do. But the men in the Bible, they were led. All of those things that they accomplished for God, they didn't just decide. God told them and they were obedient to the instruction of God and scriptures were written. And we read them today. But we want to read scripture and go on to do what we think. You understand? And I'm saying that every time when we do that, we will understand that we'll always be met with great opposition. You understand? So so I want us to understand that... Um, uh, I want us to understand that the the key, like I said earlier when we, when we started, the key that we get from all of these men that we're talking about, when we're talking about the rich men of Bible times, when we're talking about the men who made it through God, when we're talking about the men who prospered in possessions in gold and silver and, 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 and property during those current days through God, we understand that this man had one common thing, and that common thing was this man dedicated their wealth and their riches to God. They dedicated, they always gave back to God. We looked at the other day, uh, Cain and Abel too. How that Cain, Cain and Abel, they had this tradition that they were taught by their father too. That every time when we reduce our, when we receive our produce, when my cattle, this is Abel. When my cattle produces, when my land, this is Cain. When my land produces crops, we will all appear before God and present our substance to God and honor the Lord for our increase. So I'm saying this this is this was their only secret. Do you understand? It was their only biggest secret. Do you understand? It was their main secret, their only biggest one. That these men understood this thing that we need to be obedient to this extent that we dedicate our things to the Lord and we give them back to God. So I'm saying this is where we must find ourselves too, where we say to us that with my more or my little, listen, with my more or little, I will dedicate to God. I will give it to God. Do you understand? I will give this to the Lord. I will trust the Lord with this. Do you understand? So, so, so I want to say that I want to say that when we dedicate our wealth, when we dedicate our riches, when we dedicate our little or more, or when we dedicate that one possession to God, this is how we wage a warfare in the area of finance. The area, the warfare in the area of finance, we fight it like this. I always give you guys this example. This is how we fight in the area of finance. We fi we fight it like this. We say this money is not enough. Do you understand? This money, Lord, you know, it's not enough. 
But this is how I wage my warfare in the area of finance because I know that the enemy, the enemy does not want me trusting you. The enemy does not want me believing according to your principles. So, you know, it's like it's so funny that at times we find ourselves ourselves living through the principles of the enemy which are not God's. Because when we read about God, Scripture tells us about God that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And when we read Scripture, Scripture tells us that given it shall be given back unto you, a good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over. Like these are Scriptures that we read from Scripture. Like this is the nature of God. To give is God's nature. God gave His Son to reap the world. And Scripture tells us that you must do the same too. You must give and it shall be given back unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. So I'm saying... Now, this is me now in 2024. You understand? I feel like what I have is not enough. I feel like the substance that I continuously get every month, it's not enough for me. But I understand what Scripture says. Scripture says I must give because God gave. But now it's not enough. So if every month I feel like, yo, I can't give, this is not enough, I can't. So it's like I'm automatically walking outside kingdom principle. I'm automatically walking outside kingdom principle. And if the enemy can, st if people of God, we all know what scripture says about the enemy. Scripture says that the, the enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy. The enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy. So if the enemy comes to attack in my life in the area of finance, if I'm a position who doesn't dedicate my, my wealth, my possession, my substance to the Lord, that area in my life is open. Do you understand? It's so open. But then if I learn to do this, okay, this is what God gave me. Do you understand? This is what God gave me this month. Lord, with this or with this too, Lord, I choose to honor you with this. It's not enough even put together, but I choose to take this two and I choose to put them at your feet, Lord. It's not enough, but I choose to honor you with this. It's not enough, but I'm thankful that you gave me this. It's not enough, but I'm thankful still. This, I'm giving it back to you. I'm saying that that's how we wage a warfare in the area of finance. We wage a warfare in the area of finance by giving back to God when it's not enough. That's how we fight. This thing is not enough. I want more, but it's not enough. But Lord, I, I choose to fight my senses. I choose to fight my, my dependency on this. Do you understand? I fight my dependency on money. I am fighting it by taking this thing that's not even enough to you. I'm fighting my dependency on money. I won't make it through money. I choose to honor you. People of God, yo, you know, there's something that the Lord told me. There's something that the Lord told me. I wanted to, I just wrote it, this down and I told myself I was going to share about this in church, right? Whenever the window of teaching about uh, giving will open again. You know, the Lord told me something. Actually, there was something that had just happened which caught my attention. And so I was just inquiring from the Lord saying, Lord, how? How did you open that door? And then the Lord started taking me back. He started taking me back, started saying to me that, no, do you understand? What you need to understand is that when you look at those people, those people fell into a situation. He was showing me some people. Say so those people fell into a situation and, and they fell into that situation. They lost a lot of what they had. They lost a lot of what they had. But over time, they started learning about kingdom principles in the area of giving and obedience in giving when it's not fashionable. So the Lord said to me, they committed themselves to that, to honor me with their substance. So they started being consistent in that. Did they have enough? It was not. So the Lord says to me, every time when we put ourselves in that journey of honoring God with our substance when it's not enough, people of God, what begins to happen is that how do I explain this? People of God, do you know, let me say this about you. Do you know that there is, there is inheritance for you on earth here? That is for you, but you don't know about it. There are doors that God has set for you, but you don't know about them. Okay, maybe let me just, let me just, let me just, let me just uh, continue. So the Lord began to say to me that, let me, let me, let me look at this. This is going to be interesting. Um, the Lord began to say to me that there are hidden treasures. There are hidden treasures for people on earth that people don't know about. They can't get those hidden treasures which are here on earth hidden for them because they, they don't know how to wrestle in the area of finance. The enemy's mind when it comes to finance is this, that this thing is not enough. Keep it to yourself. Eat all of it. Don't even give to God. Don't even honor God with anything. That's the enemy's tactic. But the Lord says to me that if people get to a point where they understand kingdom principle and they begin to honor me with the little that they have, 
those hidden treasures will find there. Let me just give you a scripture to back this up so that it can make sense as I explain. Do you understand? The Lord says that, the Lord said, showed me the scripture. It's like, um, if people learn to honor me with their substance, the Lord says, I will begin to send men to find them. He began to give me the example of Jesus when Jesus was born. That when Jesus was born, there were wise men which came to Jesus, to the birth of Christ with gold. Did Joseph know them? No. Did Mary know them? No. But God had sent those men to them. So, do you understand? There, were, there was always treasures that were stored on earth for Christ. They were there before he was born as a, as a man. But the day he got born, God sent people. Do you understand? People found Jesus when he was born. No one told them about him. No, no direction, no nothing. God gave them a star. And we know that what stars represent, right? Stars represent the angelic. So the scripture says that they saw a star up there. Do you understand? They started following that star. That star led them to where Christ was born. So I'm saying, once we put kingdom principles when it's not fashionable, when it's not fun, when it's not nice, we put kingdom principle, we put obedience above everything, people of God, the Lord will send men to you. Doors will open that you did not know about. People of God, the Lord's like to me, I was, I was praying, I was praying the other day, listen, I was praying the other day, the Lord says to me, do you know that there is hostaged treasure in the realm of the spirit? Things that the enemy has kept bound, which are for the church. But the only way that the church can get these things in is when they step out in faith. The Lord says to me, there are so many treasures in the realm of the spirit for the church, but those things can only be received when they step out. People go, you know, back then, back then I used to tell myself that, nah, God has to do these things if he loves me. No, it does not work like that. God loves us, but there are principles. God loves us so much, but there are principles. For example, let me give you an example. Maybe if you're like, no, no, no. People of God, God loves all of us in the world. But there are certain people who are not born again. And he says they must get born again. Otherwise, they won't make it to heaven. But he loves them. But he says they must get born again. Because that's a kingdom principle. He loves them so much. He died for them. But they must still accept him as their Lord and their Savior. So it's like that. We can't say that God must open these doors. No, they are principles. Do you understand? God loves all of us, but he has set principles that govern the kingdom. And the kingdom works through principles. It works like that. So I'm saying if we can learn obedience, learn obedience from the Lord, learn to be led of the Lord, I can assure you that our finances shall begin to change because we will be operating from a place of obedience and God will open doors that you did not even know about. You know, I was, I was, I was talking to, I was talking to someone the other week. I was talking to someone the other week, and that particular person tells me that, you know what happened? So and so, uh, something happened to so and so. So and so went to this other government office, and when they went to that government office for just a random issue, and then when they get there at the government office, they're like, yo, the government has been looking for people from your family we've been looking at for looking for you guys for a very long time we didn't know where you are and then that that person's like for us why are you looking for us and then that person's like no there's a there's a plot there's a farm somewhere that the government wants to buy but according to the law the government can't just take a land without buying it from the owners and the owner was your great grandfather, so it's re registered under his name. So we've been looking for you guys so that the government can buy the land from you. It's like, what land? We don't have any land. They're like, yeah, you don't know, but it's there. Like, this was land that was your great grandfather's. And since you guys are here now, the government wants to buy this from you. So go to that office. So she now goes with her other siblings to the offices. They try to, and they discover that, yeah, this thing is really, it's there. They sign the paper, sign the paper. As we speak now, people are waiting for a payment. So I'm trying to say that there are hidden treasures out there which will only be unlocked by obedience. Like I'm saying, when baby Jesus is born, baby Jesus is born, Mary and Joseph don't even know that God has sent people. So I'm saying obedience above everything, obedience above everything. If we can only be willing and obedient, we will eat the good of the land. I quoted this scripture the other day, Isaiah chapter 1. If you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. There's treasures out there that you don't know about which have your name on it. But until we step out in faith and obedience and honor God. Uh, so like, you know, 
I, I don't think I've ever enjoyed talking about giving like I enjoy these days because like I'm not your Sunday pastor. Do you understand? Do you know, there's so much freedom when you're teaching, knowing that you're not teaching these people so that they can give you money. You're just teaching them basic principle. They decide what they'll go and do with God wherever they go. Do you understand? And I'm trying to teach you guys basic kingdom principles that learn to honor God with your substance. Learn to honor God with your substance. Whether it's enough, it's not enough, it's a lot, it's not, it's more than you have, it's not. Learn to honor God. God uh, through your substance also. Learn to honor God. We read this scripture, yo, people of God. We read, you know, who remembers when we're talking about the churches of Macedonia? People of God, Paul tells the, the, the Corinthians, says to the Corinthians, since you guys are good in preaching, you're good in prophesying, you have gifted speakers and knowledge. You are excelling in these gifts. You're excelling in preaching. You're excelling in prophecy. He says to them, excel in giving also. And then after that, he says, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that though he was poor, yet he became, um, he, though he, he was rich, yet he became poor, so that you for your sakes can become rich. So we are saying, it's like, it's like when Christ died at the cross, he made an exchange. He bought our poverty. He bought our lack. He bought our everything for his riches. But everything that Jesus Christ died for is accessed by faith. Everything that Jesus died for is accessed by faith. Even the salvation that Jesus Christ gives us freely, it's accessed by faith. It's accessed by faith. So I'm saying in the same way in the area of finance, let us note that key. Let us note this thing down and say that people of God... So I know that maybe when you're listening to me right now, you might be thinking, ah, what could be there for me? Ah, what could be there for me? People of God... Do you think that Mary and Joseph thought that they were rich men that were going to come and give them gold when they gave birth to Jesus? Do you think they knew that they were men who were going to come with gold and silver and say, this is yours? They never thought that. So it's not your duty to calculate the maths of God, the physics of God, the chemistry of God that God calculates and multiplies in the realm of the spirit. It's not your duty to multiply that. Your duty is to follow principle. And God knows how to lead people to you. You know, say you find that most of us, most of us are, 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 are in business or we've been trying business or most of us are working and we, we are looking for jobs. Most of us are this. But if we could only understand this thing, say to God, God, with my business, I, st- I want to start working in obedience now. You, you'll be surprised how God will just line up everything for you, you people of God. You know, yo, I don't even know how to explain. I don't even know how to explain this. People of God, look at look at Isaac. Scripture says in a, in a famine, Isaac planted, he sought in a famine. In a famine where everything was bad, scripture says that Isaac became great in a famine. He be, people of God, he didn't just reap, he became great. Scripture says he became great, he waxed great. He became a giant till the president had to come and say that you you, you are not too much, leave. And I'm saying that that's what obedience does. You might be thinking there, think of, thinking of yourself, saying, yo, look at me, look at my family, look at where we come from, look at what I have. I don't need, didn't even go to school. People of God, Abraham did not have any degree. You might be thinking to yourself, look at the people of God. There is no record in scripture where God ever went to anyone and first started by saying, which university? And Abraham was like, I went to the University of Gera. And God's like, ah, the University of Gera. You learned with Philistines. Aye, 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 let me look for another one. God does not do that. Do you understand? God comes to you because before you were formed in your mother's womb, he had a purpose. And he comes for that purpose. It's not your duty to understand the entire purpose. Your duty is obedience. And as you obey, as you obey, the purpose of God begins to unveil. God will begin to line you up. People of God, look at Joseph. Look at Joseph. Joseph goes to Egypt as a slave. People of God, listen, listen. Um, Joseph, okay, scholars say Joseph went to Egypt when he was around 17, right? He goes to Egypt. They sold him when he was around 17. Joseph became prime minister at the age of 30. Joseph becomes prime minister at the age of 30. People go, this is a practical example that I want to give you so that I can make you understand what I mean about hidden treasures, what I mean about hostaged treasures in the spirit which are yours, uh, but the enemy is holding them hostage. So I want you to look at Joseph. Do you think that Joseph, after spending 13 years in Egypt as a servant and as a prisoner, do you think that Joseph thought that there was anything left for him in this world? Do you think that Joseph would sit down and be like, yeah, I'm going to make it? Joseph had 
he had he had every reason to believe that he had no hope he had no reason to believe that he would just die in prison he has no he had no reason not to believe all of that he had no reason to believe that his life was done but look at god look at god how that god came and brought to joseph hidden treasures treasures things that had been locked up in the spirit things that god had prepared for joseph they just began to unlock look next thing joseph from prison to prime minister from having nothing to own to people of god i i think we should look at this the story of joseph one day scripture says that joseph fresh from prison the pharaoh said only at the throne will i be greater than you otherwise we are no when we are not in the throne room here joseph you are the greatest man in egypt scripture says that the pharaoh took his ring and gave to joseph rings speak of authority from a man who's coming from the back of beyond you know, you know what the back of beyond is beyond is at the back the far back the far beyond is the back 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 and joseph was coming from the back of beyond the back of the backest <laughs> but God brought him to the front. I'm trying to show you that there are things for us here on this world. We, people of God, we might feel like we've been consumed by everything. You know, most of us might, might feel like, yo, I just want to grow in God and love God. Like, this is my life. But that's not your life. That is the life that the enemy wants you to think is your life. That is the life that the enemy wants you to think is your life. But I'm saying, try to put kingdom principles into play. You'll be surprised. Uh, you'll be surprised when you try to put kingdom principles into play. You'll discover that really there are hidden treasures out there. There are hidden treasures, hostage treasures by the enemy, which we can only plug out of the hands of the enemy by being obedient to God. If we are willing and obedient, we will eat the good of the land. If we are willing and obedient, we will sow in a dry ground and reap. Because we carry the blessing of God. Do you understand? So... People of God, uh, <laughs> I'm saying that if only we could, we could be obedient, they will, God will send us men. Men who will come and present gold and silver and myrrh and frankincense. Do you understand? That's, that's, what, that's what happened. So, <laughs> so, people of God, we need to understand that wealth, wealth is spiritual first. Wealth is spiritual first. Even if you look at these unbelievers, these unbelievers who don't go to God will do their own things to get wealth. Their wealth is spiritual first. They go and dedicate and kill people to get rich. They go and kill people out there, sacrifice stuff to get rich. Because they they understand that this thing is spiritual. But we, ah, we Christians, ah, we, ah, we just want to think that we'll go out there, you know, we'll go out there. No principle, no following God, no prayer, no nothing. A God must just, just. But I explained this, I explained this the other week and say, Jesus Christ comes to the disciples and says, um, All power has been given unto me, now I give it unto you. Go, therefore. So what do you think that means? Jesus Christ says, All power has been given unto me, but now I'm giving it to you. Go, therefore. What do you think that means? Do you think that there is anything that God can do? He comes and says, all power has been given unto me, now I'm giving it to you. So can you see that he's showing us that the power to break everything, anything, it lies with us. The power to break everything, it lies with us. Jesus Christ literally said to the, came and said to the disciples, go in my name and fight the devil. Go and cast devils out of people. In my name, go do that. He doesn't say that, you know what, I'll go and cast out all the demons for you. I'll go and fight principalities for you. No, he says, you go and fight. And that's why Paul Kahn says, we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. We wrestle with principalities because we are in the fight. Jesus Christ gave us the power. Didn't say that I'll fight all of all of them for you. People go, you know, I always think that if Jesus wanted, if Jesus wanted... If Jesus wanted, he could have at the cross there went to the devil, arrested the devil and kept him bound. But he didn't do that. Say to himself, I want to teach this devil a lesson. I want to show him that he's nothing. Instead of me beating him here on earth, I want to give my people power so that my people can show him flames here on the earth. But now the people that have been given power, we are still saying, I, I, God loves me, he must do this. God loves me, I'm born again, God must. Yeah. 
<laughs> you know that thing that used to trend Indo da must. <laughs> Till now we are the Ujesu must. Jesus must. Ujesu must. There is no Jesu must. You must. You must go out there and cast out devils. You must go out there and honor God with your substance. You must go out there and walk by faith. You must go out there and trust God above all things. You must. You must. There's no Jesu must. You understand? So, <laughs> so I, uh, people of God. So I'm saying wealth. <laughs> uh, I'm saying people of God, wealth is spiritual first. So we will only begin to experience wealth if we follow spiritual principles of the kingdom of God. You understand? And as much as people from the dark world, they follow their own principles there. Do you understand? Though theirs, it's, it's, it's not real wealth because it's not from Christ. Do you understand? So I'm saying people understand that power, real power, real prosperity is spiritual. So how do we get uh, real wealth from God? We follow God's principles. We follow spiritual principles. And I'm saying to you, people of God, that there is, there is, hun- there is millions out there. There is hundreds of thousands and millions that God has given you. But you need to wrestle for that. You need to pray. You need to give. You need to pray. You need to give. You need to pray. People of God, I always talk about Cornelius. Okay, we're going to maybe talk about Cornelius when we get time. That Cornelius, we've spoken about him in passing. I'll just talk about him in passing too. Scripture tells us about Cornelius. This is what Scripture tells us about Cornelius. Cornelius was this a rich Roman man, right, who had soldiers. Scripture tells us Cornelius, Cornelius always did two things. These are the two things that Cornelius did in his life. Acts chapter 10. It says Cornelius prayed, one, and gave, always. <laughs> he prayed and he gave always. Do you understand? Cornelius was not a prayer, a prayer warrior. Oh, but when it comes to people of God, you know those people in church. Where's my wallet? Where's my wallet? Hi, boy. Where did I put my wallet? I okay. I can't find my wallet. So, oh no, I think it's here. I think it's here. I think it's here. Cornelius. Okay, this is my wallet, right? So Cornelius. Cornelius. <laughs> Cornelius is not that person that he was a prayer warrior, praying too much. But now when it's time for giving, he's looking for his wallet. You know, it's like he's looking for his wallet, like he can't find his wallet. Cornelius understood that these things go together. They go together. I pray and I give. I pray and I give. <laughs> I pray and I give. Some of us, you know, people of God, I, I think that thing that we spoke about in the in the churches of Macedonia, it just levels this mountain flat. Paul says that you can't, you can't, you can't, you just can't be excelling in prophecy only and not giving, in preaching only and not giving, in eloquency of speech and gifted speakers, but you don't give. Paul says, no, excel in both. These must go together. So I'm saying to you that people of God, we can't be prayer warriors who wake up at 12 midnight and we're praying until 4. You know, we wake up, we pray, we wake up, but when it's time to give, we're like, ah, yeah, yeah, eh. <laughs> we can't be like that. And then after that, we wonder, we have prayed, but God is not, pro- no, those things go together. He prayed always. He prayed and gave always. That was his life. Do you understand? And God just has a way of multiplying and multiplying and multiplying and multiplying as long as we follow kingdom principle. Do you understand? So, okay, so Paul says, Paul says, Paul says, uh, let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6. So Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So, 
can you hear what Paul says? Paul says that we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. So I remember when we started talking about this, I said to us that people of God, it's not, most of us normally want to say, yeah, it's that man, it's that woman. Yeah, if only my, my aunt was not bewitching us when we were young. <laughs> if only my grandmother did not bewitch us when we were young. So Paul comes in to say that, nah, 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 you're getting it wrong. Um, what we're wrestling with are principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. They just manifested themselves through the ant, through whoever. But the real, real, real thing that you need to overcome, it's spiritual wickedness in high places, it's principalities, it's powers. And Paul says, how do we do that? We say, Paul says, we do that by putting on the whole armor of God. So now, since we're talking about the the area of finance. How do I put on the area of finance? How do I put on the armor of God in the area of finance? Yeah, I almost said, how do I put on the area of finance? Yeah. How do I put on the 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 armor of God in the area of finance? How do I make sure that now I can stand? Because Paul says, uh, the only way we can stand, that stand there does not only speak of uh, uh, demons or witches being unable to be which you owned. It speaks of finances too. You must stand in the area of finance. Paul says that you must put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand. Do you understand? You must have a good, do you know that term that people like, you must have a good financial standing. <laughs> so how do I have a good financial standing? Because now we know that we are seeing that we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. We wrestle with principalities and powers. And now there is an armor of God that we need to put on. So now we need to know, how do I put on the armor of God so that I can stand? So that my finances can, can be safe. So that I can shield and withstand the enemy in the area of finance. Do you understand? So, you know, in the book of Revelation, uh, should we... Okay, maybe, I don't know, maybe sometime next week or maybe tomorrow if I can fit this in. In the book of Revelation, there is a Babylonian system, right? I'm just going to talk about it in passing and maybe just try and prepare something solid on it. Scriptures in the book of Revelation teaches us about a Babylonian system. So people of God, when you look at... Actually, I think we must look at this. Yo, but tomorrow... No, not tomorrow. Yo, yo, uh, Thursday. Uh, okay, I'll see. I'll see. I'll see where, how we finish today. And then if we can't look at it uh, by... If we can't look at it on Thursday, maybe we can see if we can have a live on Friday just to try and explain this. So in the book of Revelation, we find what is called the Babylonian system. The Babylonian system, according to the book of Revelation, it's a system that is set up by the devil, the enemy, that just runs everything. It runs everything in the world. It runs everything in the world, but it makes sure that it suffocates the people of God. So to the extent that businesses which are built on God, they should drown and suffocate and close. But the Babylonian system seeks to prosper people who follow the enemy, people who follow these sacrifices that the enemy wants, people who follow um, the devil's way of prosperity. It seeks to prosper those only, but it seeks to suffocate every business which is from God. So now... But now when we come to the book of uh, Ephesians, the book of Ephesians shows us that, nah, the Babylonian system might stand and do whatever it wants, but put on the whole armor of God. You'll stand against all the wiles, all of them. Paul there doesn't say that there are some. Maybe that will still stand. Paul, stand. Paul says if you put on the whole armor of God, all of them, Babylonian system, what, what system, anything, you'll be able to withstand. So when we look at the Babylonian system, we see that the devil, like, it's like we see the enemy capturing every corner of the economy, trying to make sure that the, the, the business people that prosper are only business people that follow him. So now you begin to see warfare, how that the, the enemy tries to bring this financial warfare to the church to make sure that the church is always running in lack. So, do you know how the enemy always wins in financial warfare, in the area of finance, in making sure, that, making sure that believers never prosper? He just, all that he needs to do is to just come to believers and try to tell believers that, now you don't have enough. You don't have enough and God will understand. But that's a principle. Just imagine, people of God, it's just like, 
the devil saying to you that you don't have to forgive that person. That person hurt you so much. God will understand. Is that a thing? Or, or just imagine the devil coming to you to tell you that, nah, just sleep with that boy. Just sleep with that girl. You love her so much, right? You, you love her so much with all of your heart and you want to marry her. You want to marry him. So just sleep with her. God will understand. That's what happens when the devil comes to us in the area of finance. It's like, nah, God will understand. No, it does not work like that. There are principles. Jesus Christ said, if you're faithful with the little, you'll be faithful with more. He says, if you're faithful with the little, he will entrust you with more. But if you're not faithful with little, he will not trust you with more. So I'm trying to show us that at times the enemy tries to come like he's preaching to us a good gospel but a good gospel that does not follow principle you know he's like nah god will understand hey. <laughs> yeah you know god do, do you know that story um do you, do you know that story where jesus christ stood when people were offering the scripture says that jesus christ stood there as people were offering and some people were giving out of their treasures and one woman came. Did she give one mite? She just gave one mite. Let's just say one rand. That woman went to the offering basket when people were giving so much. She had one rand. She went and gave that one rand. And Jesus Christ stood and said, Jesus Christ stood and said, You know what? This woman gave more than all of them. Do you understand? Because from how that woman gave, it, it was not like how the other ones were giving. So I'm always trying to stress on being led in our giving. So it's like when Jesus, Jesus Christ is God, just remember, Jesus Christ is God. So when he's looking at all of those people giving, he just sees that, yeah, there's only one person who gave you. And it's this one who gave the least. So by using this example, I'm trying to show you that it's not about an amount. The amount is the last thing on God's mind. How much is the last thing on God's mind? The biggest thing on God's mind is something that he has an issue with. It's obedience. That's what God has an issue with. I tried giving you guys an example last week and said, how do you think it was going to be? God says to Abraham, offer Isaac. And Abraham decides, nah, I'm just going to take Ishmael. Anyways, Ishmael's mom, nah, it was a mistake. It was a mistake. How do you think it was going to go down with God? He still gave a son, but is that the son that God wanted? No. <laughs> God did not ask for Ishmael. He wanted Isaac. That one, that son, that means something to him. Do you understand? That's what God... So I'm saying God has an issue with disobedience. It's not the amount. So if we can learn that, that scriptures teaches about this in Isaiah, be willing and obedient. Then the next thing that follows, you will eat the good of the land. So how do we eat the good of the land? How do we get to a point where whatever is here on earth becomes ours? Where our hidden treasures begin, uh, begin to get revealed to us? How do we get to a place where God begins to send men like the wise men who come with gold and, and they come to find us? How do we get to a point where opportunities start looking for us? How do we get to a point where positions start looking for us? People of God, Joseph did not apply to be prime minister. He didn't even send a CV. Do you understand? Joseph did not send a CV and attend an interview and tried showing everyone that he's well able to do this. Scripture says that God qualified him. God was his CV. He stood there and up until the Pharaoh said, you know what? I think, think, I think I'll take you. I think I'll take you. Do you understand? So when we're looking at Joseph, we're looking at someone who had endured the processes of God. He, Joseph endured the process of God. He was tested to, 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 the, to, to the last point sold as a slave. Potiphar's wife lies about him, he goes to prison. All of those things were just processes to take him through. People of God, if Joseph was any of us, he would have given up, but Joseph did not. He just stood there. Or every trial that came, whether it was God, it was the devil, it was whoever, it was what, Joseph understood one thing. I'm going to continuously save the Lord in this area. So I want to take the life of Joseph. I know that it doesn't talk about giving and what we're talking about, but I want to talk about the life of Joseph, the, his endurance part. 
To say that at times we need to have that mind. Tell ourselves, I know I've been giving to God. Maybe I haven't seen what I've been giving coming back to me, pressed down, shaken together. But have the mind of Joseph. We are not giving up until. We tarry until. God always shows up, people of God. God always comes. The problem is we are impatient at times. We feel like we've done so much and God, people of God, Joseph stayed there. He waited there. And look at the rewards that he got. People of God, I, uh, <laughs> there's one scripture. I, I feel like now we should look at the story of Joseph. Like I feel like I'm, I'm, tori- I'm talking too much about it. People of God, scriptures tells us that Joseph waited on the process of God so much that um, when he was made prime minister, and he finally got a wife. When Joseph finally got a wife, scripture says that Joseph, uh, scripture says that Joseph got a son. Scripture says that his the name of Joseph's son, first son was Manasseh. And scripture says that Joseph named his first son Manasseh because he said, God has made me forget all my problems and all my trials from my father's house. It's like Joseph got to a point, people of God, despite suffering for 17 years, Joseph got to a point where one day he said, yo, I can't believe that God has made me forget my suffering. People of God, he's not saying this in a sarcastic way. He's saying it because that was the reality of his life at that particular point. God made him forget that he suffered. The prosperity that followed him was so much that Joseph would sit and be like, so you're telling me that I used to suffer? (laughs) It. So, so I, I used to suffer. He is like, I'm just going to name my son Manasseh. And this, to me, will always remind me that God made me forget all my pain, all my toiling. All my pain, all my toiling from my father's house. People of God, I want to say to you that the will of God for you, it's for you to prosper. We can lie to each other and say, yeah, we must we must pray and go deep into the spirit. That's the will of God too, but it's prosperity too. God wants you to... People of God, scripture says that Jesus died. It's so funny that we want to only believe that Jesus died for our sins. But scripture says that he also died so that you through his poverty may be rich. In as much as he died for your sins to be forgiven and for you to go to heaven, he also died so that you can be rich. You say we can, we can debate with God if we want. We can take it all the way up to heaven if we want to try and maybe say to God we don't understand, but that's what scripture says. Scripture says that Christ in as much as he died for your sins, he died so that you through his poverty can be rich. That's a scripture. That's not me reading my own Bible from, from eBay. <laughs> it's not. It's your Bible. And God also says in the book of Jeremiah, I know the thoughts that I have concerning you. They are for you to prosper. So two scriptures speaking of the same thing, two different covenants. God still maintaining the same stance. And I'm saying that we look at Joseph, we look, we look at a man like Joseph, he's so consistent in trusting God, even as he's going through the most, he's consistent in trusting God. Listen, Joseph has been in prison for how many years? We don't know how many years he's in prison. Scripture says that one of the guards comes to Joseph and say that he had a dream. Joseph, people of God, Joseph, if I were Joseph, after having been in prison for all those years, feeling like God has left me. Hashem, I was going to let those guys have dreams that trouble them and not even interpret them. I'll just be like, yeah, I know what it means, but I'm not going to tell you because I'm mad at God. But did Joseph do that? Joseph, after enduring toil and toil and toil and toil and toil, he can still minister. He can still see people that I have dreams and Joseph can still rise up and say, I can interpret dreams. God enables me to interpret. He still stands to minister in his time of deep suffering, He can still stand and minister. So I'm saying, can you see the consistency that there there are certain things that men of old understood that we don't? Do you understand? They understood so many things. They understood, uh, like I'm telling you, if it were me, I was just going to be like, yeah. Do you you know uh, what the dreams meant though, right? One of the guys had a dream and the dream was, and the interpretation of the dream was that this guy was going to be killed. If I were Joseph, I would just sit down like look at that guy and be like, this one, they're going to kill him after like a few days. I'm not going to tell him. <laughs> I'm not going to tell him. And I'll just look at... Ish, and I'll just look at the other guy. So he looks at the other guy. The guy who um, who was the the wine the wine guy. He sees that the wine guy is going to be restored to his job. 
Shem, if I were Joseph, I was also gonna look at that guy and be like, this one doesn't even know he's going out of prison. He doesn't even know he's gonna go out. But Joseph was not like that because these men are so consistent with God. They don't serve God because things are working. Do you understand? They don't serve God because life is good. They don't serve God because they are rich. They don't serve God because they are prospering. Do you understand? In their hour of most difficult times in prison, not even knowing that he will ever be released, he still found serving God. So I'm saying that even as we are talking about this warfare in the area of finance, these are things that we must understand. Consistency. Paul says in the book of Galatians, is Galatians chapter 6 verse 9. Okay, I'm not sure. It says, do not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. It says, don't grow tired in doing good. Don't grow tired. I want to take that scripture and put it in the area of giving. Saying, don't get tired in giving. Don't. Because in due season you will reap but scripture puts a condition if you don't get tired. If you don't grow tired, you shall reap. Do you understand? So I'm saying these are, these are principles that we must employ in our lives, people of God. Scripture says that we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. They are spiritual entities in the realm of the spirit. They're trying to make sure that we don't make it at all. And they will give us every reason not to follow spiritual principles. Every reason. People of God, have you... The... <laughs> the <clears throat> The only time in a month, the only time in a month where unbelief, where unbelief and doubt and disobedience make so much sense is when you are now holding man. Uh, that is the only time where there faith un faith does not seem to be like a thing. Unbelief seems like, yeah, it makes sense. Where you are like, nah, I can I know I promised God. I know I promised God, but nah, but like I can't. Like, you know, God, 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 God is a good God. There's grace. <laughs> There's grace for these situations. Ah, that, <laughs> that time the devil throws a punch. It's like, yeah, yeah, we are done with this one, guys. We are done. We are done. <laughs> so, okay, let me just give you a short, uh, a short, a short one, right? Uh, yo, our time is gone. Let me just give you a short one, right? We are, we, are, we are yet going to look at these things and details. I'm just going to throw this one to you, right? We are yet going to look at the Joseph thing in detail and what I'm about to talk about. The widow of Zarephath. So the widow of Zarephath, uh, pro the prophet comes to... Um, uh, people of God, can we block this other one? So the, the widow of Zarephath comes to... The, actually, Elijah comes to the prophet of... Uh, to the woman of... To the widow of Zarephath. So he comes to the widow of Zarephath, and as he gets to the widow of Zarephath, he has a word from the Lord. So listen, the widow of Zarephath has uh, just little oil and flour to eat and die. But God sends the prophet to her. God sends the prophet to her. Say, this is God. God says to Elijah, go to that woman. Go to that woman, go to that woman, go to that woman. That woman, God say, listen, <laughs> you're a dive's God. Listen to, listen to the boldness in, God, in God's voice. The boldness in God's voice is when the brook ran dry, when Elijah's brook ran dry. Did I preach about the brook running dry here or was it in church? Okay, I'm not sure. So God comes to Elijah and says, go to Zarephath, for I have set myself a widow to sustain you. So listen. Elijah now, Elijah now tells himself, okay, listen, if Elijah was wearing a jacket like this, like me, after receiving a word from God saying there is a widower that God has said to sustain me, shame, zip my jacket up, fix myself. We are going to eat, my friends. We are going to eat. We, we are going to we are going to eat the good of the land. God God has prepared a woman. That woman is just going to take care of me. This is Elijah, right? So Elijah gets to the woman. <laughs> He gets to the woman, says to the woman, eh, according to the word of the Lord, uh, give me water. And as the woman is about to get her water, Elijah is like, according to the word of the Lord, according to the word of the Lord, this is what Elijah says, says, make for me a cake first. P listen, people of God, Elijah, Elijah was told by God that I will provide for you. Now he goes to this woman that he was told by God will provide. He gets there. Does the woman say, yeah, I have many, I have too much flour, my friend. I have too much oil. We can make cakes the whole day. I have too much flour. Let's just bake the whole day. What does the woman say to Elijah? 
do ones like yo my friend it's tough go rough <laughs> the economy is not economy the economy is not economy so now i'm sure elijah maybe if elijah was someone maybe he starts thinking but god say this woman is the one but this woman is nothing because god there is trying to teach us a principle that when god wanted to listen when god wanted to save that woman from a famine listen when god wanted to save that woman from a famine god saw that she just had a little oil and a little flour so god maybe all in all heaven tries to inquire in all heaven tries to okay how how can we how can we provide for that widow we don't know how what type of a heart she had why god chose her jesus christ says in the in the in the new testament says during that time during the famine there were so many widows but god chose that one we don't know why why god chose that one right but god chose her so now i'm sure god trying to ask and say how how, how do we save this widow and the son from the famine how do we save and maybe 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 god finally decides and says you know what mm, she has little flower right and then maybe the angels are like yeah and then god says she has little oil and then the angels are like yeah god just says okay let, let she, let, let's use the oil that little oil that she has let, let me let's give the prophet a weight so that the prophet can go give her my weight and if she listens to my weight if she becomes obedient to the weight I will multiply a flower and a oil. Now Elijah is speaking to the woman. The woman is like, "Nah, I have nothing." But I want to tell you that at the moment that woman was obedient to the word, God multiplied her flower. God multiplied her oil. Scripture says that 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 famine lasted for three and a half years. So maybe we don't know how much time Elijah stayed with her until the famine was done. But Scripture says that her oil never ran out because that that those are the kingdom principles. we give and god gives back we give and god multiplies us do you understand we give and god multiplies us so now when we try to summarize that whole story we ask ourselves how what saved that woman from the famine what saved the woman from the famine i'm asking a question people of god what saved that woman from the famine what saved it's a question what saved that woman from the famine what made that woman to because her mind was i just have a little flour and oil so that we eat and die what saved her from death what saved her from lack it was her obedience she was obedient and her obedience saved her from death her obedience made her flour multiply do you understand so i'm trying to show you these people of god that this is how the kingdom works the kingdom works through principle it works through consistency it works through co- consistency it works through faith like i i always say this that if you look at the bible If you look at the Bible Jesus Christ always would always speak about parables I'm sure I've said this before that Jesus Christ would always speak in parables and says the kingdom of God shall be like an unto a man seeking for the kingdom of God shall be like an unto a man seeking for because the kingdom is to be sought for It, we 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 spend too much time trying to seek trying to be consistent in seeking until we find in seeking until that door opens in seeking until that multiplication starts happening so how do I, how do we seek now in the area of finance we are saying we honor god with our substance it doesn't matter whether it's enough or not principles are still expected by god whether it's a lot whether it's a little because to god if you are faithful with the little more can be given unto you like i said this thing is not even about an amount It's not even an amount where you start cracking your head say yo but I don't have 20,000 to give God I don't have 5,000 to give God I don't have one ta- that is your problem do you understand it's you trying to think God is not asking for that he's asking for your obedience to the instruction that he will tell you we crack ourselves by saying yo I don't have too much money who told you that God wants too much money God just wants obedience God knows the situation you are going through and god knows how to lead you out of it in as much as god knew the the situation that the widow of zerafat was going through and god knew how to lead her out of it do you understand god knew the situation that she was going through and god knew how to guide her out of it without her dying in the process because of hunger god knew how to multiply her and he just gave an instruction and the moment the woman followed the instruction scriptures tell us that her flower never ran out her oil never ran out she just lived in abundance until the famine was done 
And I'm saying this is what we learn because people of God, listen, we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. We wrestle with principalities and powers in the realm of the spirit. That is who we are fighting with. So every time when we stand in a place of obedience, we have already overcome them because we are standing on the word of God. Our safety is on getting an instruction and we stand on it. Our safe place, our path to prosperity is getting an instruction. We sit on that instruction. It becomes my bus to my promised land. It becomes my bus to my land full of milk and honey. I'm only safe in the word of God. I can only prosper sitting on the word of God. I can't prosper on my own. Do you understand? If I want to prosper on my own, maybe I should just go look for some, some gomas out there. But if I want to make it through God, through God, you need a word. Through God, you need a word. What's this thing flying now again? Yo. Through God, you need a word. Through yo, 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 yo. Can I preach? Say, can I preach? Can I preach? Yo. So I'm saying, I'm saying through 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 God we need a word. We need to get a word and we ride on that word. That is the only way where we our finances are safe, our substance is safe, and we are guaranteed multiplication and we are guaranteed uh, multiplication by God. Do you understand? We get a word from God, we ride on that instruction, we don't rest. Do you understand? We ride on that instruction, we don't rest. We ride on that instruction, we don't rest. Our only problem, our only problem is we we want to only follow instructions when it's uh, we only want to follow instructions when it's fashionable. When we can. <laughs> Maybe let me put it like that. We 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 only want to give to God when we can. <laughs> So I want to ask you this question. Do you think if the widow of Zarephath was only willing to give to God when she could, she was going to die of anger? Do you understand? Drought was just going to drop it like this. Drought was just going to... If she was telling herself that she only listens to God when she can or when her, her substance makes sense or when what she has makes sense... Uh, <laughs> There we just put heaven on pause. If there is a button to pause heaven, <laughs> I'm not saying it's there. If there is a button to pause, what God wants to do is we wanting to say that we will give when we can. There we just pause everything that heaven wants to do because we are saying to ourselves, we are not willing to obey right now. You understand? So people of God, as I conclude this life, this is what I want to say. I'm not saying that uh, start cracking yourself over putting yourself too much pre on pressure to say, you know what, I feel like I need to give a lot more than I've ever done before, so I'm going to take this and give. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you need an instruction for your finances from God and how you must give. I've never preached about an amount. I've never preached about something that is just too much. I've heard some pastors, I've heard some pastors saying that you need to give something that will hurt you. You need to give something that will... <laughs> I'm not saying that, you understand? What I'm preaching is you need an instruction from God. What does God require from you? How does God want you to handle your finances? And how does God want you to honor Him? Do you understand? Mm. How does God want you to honor him with your substance? That that's This is what I'm trying to preach. Because that we are only safe when we are riding on that weight. We are only safe when we are sitting on that weight. It's only that weight that will guarantee us uh, success. It only, it's only that weight that will guarantee us prosperity. It's only that weight that will guarantee that we get to the place where God wants us to get to. So people of God, as I conclude, remember, we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. This is a spiritual battle. There are spiritual forces which make sure that we don't prosper. It's not because your aunt at some point said, or your mom said they can't pay your school fees anymore at university, or your uncle said Yo, your school is too expensive, or your boss fired you from work, or you can't get a job, or business is not working out. That, that's the list. If, if we are looking at things from that angle, Ah, people of God, we are still far. This is a spiritual thing. Do you understand? We're going to talk about the Babylonian system. Maybe on the Babylonian system, we're going to shed more light on the warfare around uh, business, around prosperity and everything. This thing is spiritual. And the only way that we wrestle in the realm of the spirit for our finances 
is to take our finances and say, Lord, this is what I have. I'm taking from my finances to honor you. This is my honor to you. This is my gratefulness. This is me saying, Lord, this is my seed. I'm planting on the kingdom of God. Do you understand? I'm planting in the kingdom of God and I trust that, Lord, according to your kingdom principles, I'm sowing. Do you understand? So we only wrestle in the realm of the spirit by giving back. Find, find the area of finance. It's 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 finances. Do you understand? We wrestle through giving. We wrestle through giving. Okay, people of God, we've come to the end of our life. Um, okay, we'll meet on 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 today's what? Today's Tuesday. We will meet on Thursday, right? And then um. Uh, <laughs> Uh, people of God, you you know you know those you know those instances where times we like I think I remember oh I think I said this the other time that we we have been trapped in the idea where you know in the churches that we go to these days everything we are just told shout I receive <laughs> shout I receive ah, people of God there's no receiving there or <laughs> like I said that if those things worked Paul would have written to the Galatians and said Galatians Galatians chapter one verse one as you read these things, shout, I receive. <laughs> but he didn't. Instead, he teaches them principles. He teaches them principles, principle after principle after principle. Do you understand? He teaches them that do not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. But now what we would, t what we would make people do <laughs> is shout, I will reap. Shout, I will reap. But scripture says, no, don't grow weary in well-doing. You shall reap. So you see, it's a principle. It's not like a confession thing. Or I will reap in this year. I, this year is my year of harvest. And we just want to confess without teaching people how the harvest comes through the principles of God. How do we reap through the principles of God? So the kingdom of God works on principles. Do you understand? It doesn't work on uh, us creating slogans for ourselves. Us creating... Um, uh, you know, our own thing because this day it's like in the church we've created our own systems that cater for us but they're, they're not spiritual they're not godly but they're things that we feel comfortable doing you know to the extent that we just want to do our own church and still expect the god of the bible to come but we are far from the bible but we we expect the god of the bible to come out from the bible and do what he promised yet we are not following the principles that he teaches in the bible so I'm saying, how do we wrestle in the area of finance? We wrestle in the area of finance by giving back to God. Do you understand? Because the enemy would want us, the enemy would want us thinking that what we have is not enough. And because it's not enough, so we can't honor God. Yet scripture teaches that in the little that you have, God expects faithfulness. In the little, God still expects faithfulness. In the little, God expects faithfulness. But the devil would want us to believe that it's too little, God will understand. Yet God, you know, it's all funny that God is like, hey, 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 hey. Is it little? You're like, yes, God says, I want faithfulness. But the devil comes to us and says, no, it's little, God will understand. Yet God, the God of the Bible says, from the little, 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 from the little. From the little, from the little, God expects faithfulness. Uh, so, yeah, people of God. So, uh, okay, we've come to the end of our life. So we are still going to dig more into this. People of God, there's so much to talk about, about this thing. You know, like there's so much. And I believe that the area, this area is one of the areas which, even if it makes, take, even if it takes taking two months talking about this, I think it will be worth it uh, as long as you guys will carry out the principles because it, it doesn't help to just hear, 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 hear and we don't put into practicality the things that we are hearing. We can't just hear and hear and hear and hear. You know, Saint Jesus Christ says, a wise man is a man who listens and does my sayings. He says, a wise man listens, hears my sayings and he does them. 
It doesn't say that a wise man is the man who hears. It says the man who hears and does my sayings. I would like any man to a man who built on a rock. So how do you put your, how do you build your financial life on a rock? How do you build your financial life on Jesus Christ? You hear what the gospel says about finances and you do it. And according to scripture, when you start doing that, you are building on the rock. Your finances are now being built on the rock. You have already started the process of creating a hedge around your finances, a hedge that the enemy can't touch. Okay, people of God, yo, I feel like I'll start preaching a second session here. Um, okay, we've come to the end of our life. Ah, okay, people of God, have a good night. Um, let me love and leave you. Uh, Okay, no, I forgot to pray. I forgot to pray. I forgot to pray. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I give you glory. I give you honor. I give you power, praise, and majesty. I thank you, Lord, because you are God and because you are good. And Lord God, because your word comes in, Lord God, to steer us to the direction that you want us to walk in. Your word comes in, Father, to put us in places where you want us to be. It comes in to enlighten our, our minds and put us, Lord, in a place where we are better positioned to receive from you, where we are better positioned, Lord God, to get things from you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty and awesome name. I pray that, Lord God, may this word stay in us, Lord God. May we give the most earnest heed to this word and uh, make sure that this word does not slip away. Lord God, I pray that may the Holy Spirit continue to preach this word and may he help us to put all of this thing into practicality in our lives. Lord God, I pray that you continue to speak to your people, Lord God, and lead them and guide them and give them instructions, Lord God, concerning their lives and how you want them to uh, to honor you with their substance, Lord. In Jesus' mighty and awesome name, I pray. And the church of God say, Amen. <laughs> yo, people of God, uh, uh, yo, okay, let me love and leave you again before I start the second session. So, uh, okay, people of God, have a good night. Have a good night. We will meet again on Thursday and still on the on the finance question. Okay, good night, good night, good night, good night, good night. Okay. Hi Bo, who's putting this cap on me again? Uh okay, people of God. Hi Bo. This one say we must have a night service prayer. Yo, hey, okay, people of God, bye. <laughs> bye, 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 bye. Uh, <laughs> uh, I people of God, bye, bye, bye. <laughs>